I want to thank the witnesses for being here, especially on a short notice, to lend their expertise to our discussion. We're here today to take a close look at the problems that, have been, that are serious and concerns to many states for a while now, and that's wildfires. This is a challenge that confronts communities of all sizes, towns and villages, cities, states, and the federal government. As a former mayor myself, I know firsthand how important it is to have personnel and resources to prevent and fight fires when they occur. The stakes are high, and we must ensure that first responders who are, not, who are out there protecting lives, homes, and businesses receive the training and support they need. That's why we're here, to learn from these experts and leaders about the situation on the ground, across the country, from a variety of perspectives. We have to know where we're succeeding and where we need more resources or a new approach. There are many different levels of government involved in fighting fires. From locals to various federal agencies, it's important we have comprehension, comprehensive protection and response no matter where a fire occurs. I know providing that protection has become more and more expensive, especially on federal level. In the past 12 years, federal costs have averaged more than $3 billion a year. That doesn't include the $2 billion spent by state and local communities and as well as other private spending. Those costs are increasing because wildfire activity is growing. When you talk about wildfires, most people think of flat, grassy states like Montana or states hit by drought like California. But as weather patterns have been changing with the rest of our climate, more states than ever are being hit by huge wildfires. In the past decade, acres burned up are almost up by 67%. Right now in Anchorage, more than 700 men and women are fighting a dangerous fire in the Kenai. It's called the Funny River Fire, but there's nothing to joke about with this blaze. Brave firefighters, including hotshot crews and smoke jumpers, have been fighting to put out this fire since May 19th. They have done an amazing job, and all Alaskans are deeply grateful for their efforts. As of yesterday, the fire was 59% contained, and danger to life and property has been nearly eliminated. It scorched almost 200,000 acres of our forest, close to residents, businesses, and individuals. It's early in the fire season for something of this magnitude in Alaska. My state has had one of the warmest winters on record, and now strong winds and low humidity are combining to allow these fires to grow quickly. Over the weekend, there were reports of 15 new fires in the Fairbanks service area, from Chena Hot Springs to Toke. Luckily, these were relatively small fires, but they only stayed that way because of the outstanding work of our firefighters. To make sure we are prepared as we can be, that we have the resources and experienced personnel out there in the field, we have to look at the first responder hiring and retention practices. The skills men and women learn during training to become a firefighter or smoke jumper or hotshot team, members are invaluable. We must recognize their importance not just with their words, but in what we and how we treat them. Earlier today, I was proud to introduce the Senate version of the Federal Firefighter Flexibility and Fairness Act to address a glaring misstep in how we treat federal firefighters. Across the country, municipal firefighters are able to work out changes in their schedule among themselves with supervisor approval. They can trade shifts without impacting their pay schedules allowing them to take care of sick family members or attend their children's important events. This type of flexibility is important to morale and life balance, and I'm glad that state and local firefighters have it. But for some reason, federal firefighters do not. Right now, these men and women can only swap shifts within a two-week period. And the, an accounting system that the government uses ends up with one firefighter receiving no pay for the shift, while the other receives overtime. It doesn't make sense. Because the system is so nonsensical, some departments don't allow shifts swapping at all. I can't blame them for not wanting to deal with that headache, but this problem needs to be fixed. Treating our firefighters well is, a, is the morale, moral thing to do, but it's also fiscally responsible. The bravery and skills earned by these folks out in the field make it even more important to retain them as long as possible. Attrition reduces the effectiveness of our firefighting teams, which is unacceptable. We need to train and maintain the best teams we can. Clearly, that goes to for municipal firefighters as well. I've been a strong supporter of the important federal resources like fire and safer grants 
that go directly to our local fire situation. From Palmer to Nikiski, firefighters have told me how beneficial these grant programs are. That's why I'm fighting to, to, uh, that's why I'm fighting to roll back President Obama's proposed cuts to these programs in this year's appropriation bill. As a member of the Appropriations Committee, I'm committed to restoring the $10 million proposed reduction because every dollar spent will save more than that in local, com in local communities. Over the last, on one last issue I want to bring up very briefly before I introduce our witnesses is a broader issue that impacts many firefighters in Alaska. The disadvantage, disadvantages to seasonal employees in the federal hiring process. I've been working with Senator Tester and looking closely at the bill that he and Senator Mark Udall have introduced, the Land Management Workforce Flexibility Act, Senate Bill 1120. Seasonal workers are so important to Alaska, a large number of Alaskans hold different jobs based on the season since we have such unique climate. Many firefighters come from the lower 48 to help, help, us fire, help us fight fires in the summer. Right now, it seems to me that the federal hiring practices isn't giving these seasonal workers who have developed great expertise over many years a fair shot if they want to transition to a full-time job in the same field. I'm glad to hear your thoughts on this issue, and I'm looking forward to the continuing discussion with Senator Tester. I'm not sad. I'm cold. I got a cold. So, <laughs> um, Let me introduce our witnesses, and I'll start with um, Mr. Jim Hubbard, is the de Deputy Chief of the U.S. Forest Service, which is part of the Department of Agriculture. Jim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to be here. Uh, as you've noted, uh, we're, we're into the fire season, Alaska is especially. Uh, Arizona and New Mexico are having uh, normal fire activity, but it's, uh, it's busy. Uh, the Funny River Fire is a, a bit unusual. Uh, you don't have 200,000 acres burn on the Kenai very often, and, uh, and that gets a lot of attention, especially with the, the values at risk and the people in the way. And, and what our season looks like is that uh, June will continue to be uh, that kind of a problem for, for Alaska. Maybe it'll moderate uh, uh, by the time July gets here. I hope so. Uh, Alaska went a little longer than usual uh, in past seasons. Uh, as we move further into the season and get into July, uh, California, Oregon look particularly bad. Nevada's not going to be good. Uh, so uh, that's where we expect most of our problems. It'll be scattered throughout the West as usual, and uh, we'll have surprises pop up uh, all across the West. But those three states in particular uh, look problematic. Our forecasts tell us we uh, probably will be spending more money on suppression than uh, we have in the budget, so we'll go through that process again. We are prepared. Uh, the uh, interagency forces... Uh, are at uh, 14,000 firefighters that are available to us. Uh, currently, we have uh, 14 large air tankers, but uh, we could have as many as 22 under exclusive use contract but before the season's over as uh, those next generation planes begin to fly for us. We always, uh, we still have the, uh, the eight military MAFs units as uh, surge capacity, and we do have the uh, 72 single engine air tankers under contract and uh, more than 600 helicopters under contract. So uh, the aviation forces and the ground forces are, uh, are in place for the season. But uh, the conditions are uh, uh, challenging. Uh, the long-term drought, the changing uh, conditions that we face with uh, climate and with fuels and with insect and disease have all caused problems, not to mention the the development that has to be protected that uh, is in the way of uh, some of these uh, difficult situations. Risk reduction uh, occurs on about 3 million acres per year. Uh, that's, uh, that's a substantial amount and uh, it uh, addresses some of the priorities. Uh, it does not cover the, cover the territory that needs to be, uh, the risk that needs to be reduced. Uh, it is a combination of uh, what you do on the landscape and what you do in the community and around the community that uh, uh, will, will save us in, in the future. Some of our limiting factors have to do with uh, the transfers that occur when we don't have uh, the suppression dollars to pay the bills and we have to take it out of other accounts in the Forest Service to do so. Uh, then uh, uh, 
how we budget for suppression has been uh, an ongoing debate. Uh, you mentioned do we have the resources and do we have the right approach. Perhaps uh, it, that needs another look. An another looks such as was uh, proposed uh, by Senators Wyden and Crapo in the bill they introduced that uh, suggests that perhaps uh, uh, the Forest Service and the federal agencies continue to uh, provide in their budget the, the initial attack and the forces and the cost of that initial attack. And we do catch 98% of our fires during that initial attack period. But it's those 2% that get away that cost us about 30% of that suppression budget, and those are fires that are uh, perhaps fall into a, a disaster category and ought to be treated, financed uh, differently. If that were to happen, then uh, we would hope that the agency could make proposals for, uh, for using some of that uh, uh, budget constraint to uh, increase the land uh, treatment and reduce the risk further. And that would be our uh, uh, approach, and uh, we would hope that something like that could at least be considered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me ask, uh, I'll ask a question at the end, but let me ask William Dugan, National President of the National Federation of Federal Employees. Next, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify. <clears throat> our union represents 110,000 federal workers, including 20,000 in the Forest Service. For 22 of my 31 years in federal service, I fought wildfires, serving in many positions. I spent 16 years on the Tongass National Forest in Sitka, Alaska. I can tell you, firefighting is a dangerous business. When you're on a fire, the only thing between you and trouble is your equipment and the brave men and women with you on the fire line. That's why it's so important that we arm firefighters with the training and resources they need to be safe and complete the mission. The wildfire problem in the U.S. is growing. Six of the worst fire seasons since 1960 have occurred since 2000. We must recognize that this is the new normal and we must change the way we do business to account for it. With respect to training, the USDA Inspector General issued a report in 2010 that predicted future shortages of qualified firefighters in the Forest Service. Too few were being trained to replace those retiring. That prediction is now coming to fruition and it is a major problem. Wildland firefighting agencies have done tremendous work to improve interagency cooperation. The development of a consistent certification and training system administered by the National Wildfire Coordinating Group is an outstanding achievement. Our union is proud to be a partner in the Wildland Firefighter Apprenticeship Program, which we hope will take consistency and training to the next level. Unfortunately, this program has been underutilized in our view. Within the Forest Service, training resources are not reaching the field in a timely way. From one forest, we are hearing that primary fire personnel are unable to attend training classes that are only offered out of state, leaving them no option for certain training. At another forest, we hear that managers are getting their training budget too late to get employees into classes. Congress can improve access to training by exercising oversight to ensure that the action items developed as a result of the referenced IG report are properly implemented and make certain the apprenticeship program is used to its fullest potential. Also, Congress should make every effort to appropriate funds in a timely manner so resources get to the ground in time to be used. With respect to workforce retention, the attrition rate for wildland firefighters is alarmingly high. Something must be done about it. Here's something that can, that can be done right now. For a wildland firefighter, experience is hard earned on the fire line. However, the firefighter career path is blocked by flawed and dysfunctional federal regulations. Many federal firefighters begin their careers on temporary appointments. Many return year after year acquiring valuable training and experience. However, firefighters looking to advance their careers face a critical barrier. Current regulations do not credit their service regardless of how long as qualifying for acquiring competitive status. Because of this barrier to career advancement, many skilled firefighters eventually leave, taking their valuable skills with them. To explain, agencies have the flexibility to fill positions from current employees under merit promotion or from among civilian applicants under the competitive process. Over two million other federal employees have the status to compete under merit promotion. However, firefighters classified as temporary seasonal workers do not. They cannot compete for jobs filled under merit promotion procedures. 
We strongly urge passage of the Bipartisan Land Management Workforce Flexibility Act, S1120, which would address this inequity. Funding for wildfire suppression is also a problem. With the occurrence and severity of wildfires increasing, the portion of the budget that goes to fire suppression and preparedness has increased dramatically. The expense of fighting wildfires often exceeds the funds appropriated for wildfire suppression. When this happens, agencies transfer funds from other programs into firefighting accounts to cover the shortfall. This so-called fire borrowing results in cancellations and delays in the agency's on-the-ground program of work. Ironically, many of the canceled projects are those designed to reduce the frequency and severity of catastrophic wildfires. It's robbing Peter to pay Paul and it costs taxpayers more. We urge Congress to pass the Wildfire Disaster Funding Act, S1875, to address this. I will conclude my testimony by quoting one of our members currently out on fire assignment in Alaska. In Alaska, we do have a well-constructed tactical plan to deal with fires, but wildland fires are on the increase. We fight to put the fires out immediately. We address the hazardous fuels, but sometimes forests are allowed to grow into a dangerous state of overgrowth and decay, causing a hazardous situation. It is time for Congress to take action to provide the resources and the flexibility necessary to prevent this hazardous situation from occurring in national forests across the country and to protect communities across our nation from wildfire. These reforms cannot wait until next year. They need to be acted on immediately. I thank the subcommittee for holding this hearing and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. And just to note, all the written testimony also is included in the record uh, to augment your verbal testimony. Uh, next, we have Kevin O'Connor, Assistant to the General President for the Public Policy of the International Association of Firefighters. Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here today representing 300,000 professional firefighters and paramedics who provide fire, rescue, and EMS services across our great nation. First, let me thank you for the introduction of the Flexibility Act, and our federal firefighters greatly appreciate it and for your stalwart support on appropriation for the other programs. It's very much appreciated by our organization. Wildland fires are increased in intensity, duration, and scope. They're a threat from coast to coast. From 2003 to 2012, over 17 million acres have been scorched by wildfires, claiming over 300 lives, destroying 34,000 homes, and resulting in over $70 billion in insurance claims. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the raging fires currently threatening your state are a stark reminder of this present danger. Before the hearing, we spoke with Tom Rescott, our state president in Alaska, and he estimates that the vast majority of his membership, municipal firefighters, will be engaged in those efforts before the fire is finally brought under control. The scourge of wildfires has become epidemic and will continue to imperil our nation. The IAFF supports the administration's proposal, changing the way in which federal government budgets for wildland firefighting. It makes sense, it should be done, but it is only a first step. For decades, foresters and firefighters have battled on how to deal with wildfires. Today, with the increased development of the wildland-urban interface, we must develop a more global and holistic strategy to deal with this issue. Clearly, the federal government must take the lead. We applaud Congress for mandating the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. This strategy establishes a national vision for wildland fire management and response. The strategy is an excellent first step but once again, more must be done. In the 1960s and 70s, American cities were blighted by an epidemic of arson and fire deaths, analogous to what is occurring today with wildfires. To address this crisis, the National Commission on Fire Prevention and Control issued the landmark report, America Burning. Over 40 years later, the document is frequently cited and still has value. The federal government should take a similar approach to the wildland fire problem. We propose the establishment of a Blue Ribbon Commission modeled after America Burning with congressional participation to fully study this issue and make recommendations. Although the IAFF has implored the administration to establish such a commission, they have yet to act. The federal government is the only entity that can ensure the participation of all stakeholders. We hope that either on their own volition or with a gentle nudge from Congress, they will soon act. State and local governments also contend with devastating wildland fires. On privately held or state-owned lands, Firefighting operations are exclusively handled by state and local assets. It's safe to say that west of the Mississippi and throughout the southeast, nearly every firefighter will ultimately be called upon to fight a wildfire. Disturbingly, not all firefighters are trained to battle these fires. 
Cash-strapped fire departments frequently cannot afford to provide training. We propose that the federal government establish a pilot program to provide wildland fire training for local firefighters in high-risk areas. Furthermore, because firefighting is an inherently governmental function, it should be a default policy of the federal government to contract with a governmental entity having jurisdiction in the impacted area if additional firefighting resources are needed beyond the federal effort. However, if private contractors are required, they should be required to meet the same rigorous standards of their governmental counterparts, period. This is an issue of public safety, firefighter safety, and operational efficiency. Lastly, we need to protect the men and women on the fire line. Not quite a year ago, 19 brave wildland firefighters from the Granite Mountain Hotshots team and proud members of IAFF Local 3066 died in the line of duty battling the Yarnell Hill fire. Those tragic deaths, and indeed the death or injury of any wildland firefighter, should give us pause. Wildland firefighters, if firefighting is physically taxing, emotionally draining, and incredibly dangerous. The job differs greatly from that of a structural firefighter. Wildland firefighters are on scene fighting fire for days or even weeks at a time. Through government investment and research over many years, much is known about the health impacts of fighting fire for structural firefighters and how best to protect them. But we're only beginning to examine these impacts on wildland firefighters. As a leader in firefighter health and safety, the IAFF is uniquely positioned to help coordinate research efforts. With our California Forestry Local 2881, San Diego State University, and much appreciated funding from the Department of Agriculture, research has already started. San Diego, partnering with CDF, studied improving protective clothing worn by wildland firefighters a great start. To prevent death and injury, it is incumbent that we study appropriate staffing patterns and other operational metrics to ascertain the impact on firefighter health and safety. Partial funding from DOA has been provided for such efforts, and we encourage the federal government to continue this investment until the resource is completed. In closing, we must act now and very decisively on multiple fronts to address this complicated issue. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and will gladly answer any questions. Thank you very much. And let me go to uh, Mayor Navarre, Mayor of Kenai Peninsula Borough from my state of Alaska. I was down there about a week or so ago at the Funny River Fire, which, as we all know, has been a top priority, I know, for uh, for firefighting. So we appreciate Mayor Navarre here. Thank you also for being on a pilot here of trying to use our technology. So uh, we'll allow you to testify, and then we'll uh, open up for questions after your testimony. Mayor Navarre. Thank you, Senator. Uh oh, hold tight. Thank you, Senator Vegas. I appreciate your holding this hearing and for touring the area when you did and asking the right questions about the adequacy of the response and whether or not uh, resources were available uh, where needed and when needed. And the answer to that, I think, is, is absolutely. I was exceptionally impressed with the incident command structure and the way that there was coordination between all of the agencies it, as this fire was developing, we had incredibly high winds, changing wind directions and conditions, uh, but the knowledge that they, uh, the command team had of fuel sources, uh, fire behavior, uh, logistics, all of the, the things that count uh, when you're really reacting to an ever-changing di fire dynamics was, was truly impressive. Uh, the coordination between the agencies, uh, I can't say enough about how all of the resources and the resource agencies work together. Uh, one of the things that I should point out is that the, the uh, refuge folks uh, were quick to uh, order up a command team and also had done some fire breaks uh, between urban and wildland interface that really were critical to the way that the planning and protection of the populated areas and the structures there. So we were very, very fortunate. Uh, so I want to say thanks uh, to you and to the, the resources that were put towards this. And the result was that we had very few uh, small structures, some remote cabins that were lost. Absent that, uh, all of the residential areas were protected. The priorities were clear from the outset, that is protection of the firefighters who were employed, um, also protection of, of life and property in the uh, 
urban areas and the developed areas around the peninsula, and then looking at, at where the infrastructure, important infrastructure is, and uh, including some very high voltage lines that uh, needed to be protected. And I want to also just talk briefly about the importance of the planning process well in advance of what we know are going to be an increasing number of wildfires, and that is uh, federal resources are important to the Kenai Peninsula in a variety of ways. We had funding over a long period of time to deal with the spruce bark beetle infestation that allowed us to build a coordinated plan that we could identify where the uh, consensus was. And where the consensus was is making sure that we enhance natural uh, fire breaks, uh, power lines, roads, uh, between urban and rural or wildland areas in the event that at some point we saw uh, a wildland fire that, that would threaten the, the developed areas. So we, over a period of time, I think we got as much as about $18 million from the federal government, and we used that to build fire breaks, to do a firewise program, to remove fuel sources. So I think that uh, that is critically important. The other thing that uh, was important and that we also used federal grant funding for was the borough's geographic information system. We have a very good system. We update it regularly. The last time we were able to update it with a federal grant, doing some aerial uh, 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 flight to gather the data and put it into our system was actually 2012. So we had pretty up-to-date information on where structures were, including in remote areas. And it allowed them to tap into our system and use it to know where they were going to muster their resources, where their fallbacks were. So it was an excellent planning tool for them. So I guess that's one of the things that in looking at uh, whether or not resources were adequate in this case, as I said, I was very, very impressed with the level of, of effort that went into this fire, the resources that were employed on the fire, the planning that went into it on a nightly basis, and then the, the planning that was put into place and executed on a, on a daily basis and sometime an hourly basis. So I think we did have uh, adequate resources. And one of the things that I'm thrilled about uh, was your efforts to get the, uh, the uh, drones at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. That was something that was uh, uh, employed in this, uh, in this fire. Uh, sort of at the end of it to do some uh, overflights, and I think that it's something that will be an even more increasingly valuable tool as we move forward. And as you know, Senator, uh, the state of Alaska has in, in incredible remote wildland areas and uh, a lot of interface between rural and urban and small pockets of uh, developed areas and population. So it's, it's critical in Alaska. So I want to again thank you and thank the incident command team, Rob Allen, uh, the, also, the uh, uh, FEMA and the pre-planning that we had through our Office of Emergency Management and the, the coordination that our uh, emergency manager did in mustering local resources to help support that effort. I think all of that, uh, you know, this was a good example of, of how, in part, we were lucky, but the reality is, is that there was a lot of planning that went into it well in advance of when a, a, a fire might happen and uh, uh, it, it really worked in this case. So it's, I think it's a good example of the right amount of resources, the right amount of expertise uh, that's brought in from a lot of different areas around the country and around the state. So it was, uh, it was impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And just so folks here in the room, these are pictures from that fire and uh, it's incredible devastation that occurred. And I was down there on Monday and as Mayor Navarre talked about, some incredible resources all came to the table at the right time. There was uh, one thing you had mentioned, Mayor, and I want to just ask you, and I, just, I made a note here, but your, your, your borough uh, mapping system, was that funded by the borough, or was that a combination of federal or state, or how, does that, how did you upgrade that? You know, it's, it's operated by the Kenai Peninsula Borough, and it's, uh, it's available publicly, and it's, it's got a lot of tools that the, the folks who are familiar with GIS systems can tap into and use to, to get all kinds of different uh, vegetation mapping. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of tools that are available on it that could, can be used to identify, as I said, where, the, where strategies can be employed to attack a fire like this. And, and, you know, the, the other thing that I should mention is, and, and you're aware of it, but oftentimes at the federal level, the sheer perspective and size of this fire was, 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 was huge. Um, and 
but in terms of the state of Alaska and even the Kenai Peninsula, um, it's only a small portion of our land mass. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me, if I can, there is a, and I, and I don't know, maybe, uh, Jim, you might be able to answer this first question I have. And when I was down there, I took a tour of some of the areas, and what I saw was these areas where they thinned out some of the trees, kind of found natural breaks. I think the mayor described some of those areas. And you could go from the very heavy clustered area, and then these thinned out areas, and then in some cases a road or a utility corridor. And uh, the, the comments I got was, you know, it was a, a raging fire, and then when it hit that thinned out area, it dropped low or to the ground. Firefighters could attack it, manage it much quicker, and, 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 and control it at that point. And they were describing to me that that came from, I was expecting to hear a big number, to be honest with you, a big cost to that piece. And they said, no, that was about $175,000 out of the wild, uh, Wildlands Fire Fund uh, that they were able to get a grant for to do that. Can you tell me kind of the status? I know that has been under pressure for many years in its financial capacity, because that's kind of, that's more preventive than disaster. So tell me a little bit about that fund and is there, uh, is the administration talking about looking long-term at that and additional resources? And does that connect at all? And I'm gonna put this issue way over here for a second. I know the president's put together a proposal, I think it was a billion dollars in um, uh, climate change issues and so forth, disaster management, some other things. Is that at all connected or just kind of a two-part question there, because I saw the impact was unbelievable, because then they showed me the area where they were unable to do it, and it just swept right across the road. It was unbelievable difference. Well, Mr. Chairman, as you just described, uh, the, the effect of, uh, of that kind of land treatment on fire behavior is, is exactly right, and uh, that's what we're after. And uh, where we place those treatments is pretty important, too, because uh, uh, if we do that in combination uh, with a community that has uh, invested in uh, being adapted to fire, a little more fire-wise, then we have a chance of protecting that community and saving it, even when fire like this comes their way. Uh, and most of that money uh, is uh, appropriated uh, through the Forest Service, and uh, we work through the state forestry agencies uh, on the private lands, at least. And uh, what happens there is a competitive process in the West with those uh, different states uh, proposing their highest priorities for protection and uh, the money being allocated. and So is that fund, that, that money comes out of for local communities like this to get grants out of, give me the, give me the sense of that. Because what I understand, it's under pressure and uh, not as robust funding as it used to be. Can you comment on that? It's, uh, we try to protect that one. Uh, uh, Does it need more? I think they have. Well, I'm giving you a softball there. I know you probably can't answer because OMB probably hasn't told you. Oh, <laughs> but, well, but feel free. What I, what I think I can say. Because I might jump to these two and they'll <laughs> <Sure>. answer it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not, you, you ask if it was connected to the, the president's climate change uh, proposal, and uh, we are working with the administration with the, through the department on uh, on what we might be able to propose in that regard, so how to part maybe, of that billion, but it maybe it, how to attack some of that money and maybe move perha it over. perhaps, but it is definitely connected to the to the proposal for how we finance suppression. If if we right. got if that were to pass or go into effect and free up uh, for the Forest Service roughly three hundred million dollars uh, of discretionary funding, and, gotcha. and the, the appropriators, of course, control that. Right. That would be our proposal to use it this way. Well, let me make sure I uh, clarify what that is, because I know some people who might be watching or later find out what we're talking about. In the past, the way your disasters were funded were fires occur, you rob all these accounts because we never funded it enough, then we come back and try to fix it all, and we never really do totally. Now the idea is, and I might be wrong about these numbers, but I know I'm close. We look back five years, figure out about 80% of what that cost is, and try to fund it so you're at least having a budget to work from so you're not robbing all these other agencies. Is that fair? That's fair. And I can tell you when I said that, and I know Mayor Navarre was there when we were doing an incident uh, press conference, and I said that one of your employees, I think, in the middle of the press conference, I loved it. He was in the back sitting, jumped up, excited about the whole thing. Because it sounds like 
that is a big piece of this puzzle that you need to kind of get out of the way in order to fund. And this is the, the piece that Wyden and Crapo are working on. But as an appropriator, I think we're going to try to do this this year yes. in the appropriations process. So that's a real positive for all of us. Is that a Thank fair statement? That's a fair statement. Thank you very much. No, we like that. Uh, let me ask you, there was a, an estimate or a we know since the 90s, the amount of money for suppression has gone from about a billion to three billion, but there's a new report or some report out there that talks about we're still going to be about a half a billion short in the efforts. Do you agree with that or based on your analysis and what you're seeing this summer? That, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> Those forecasts come from Forest Service Research and, and uh, they provide them to us periodically during the year. It's based on what's going on uh, uh, with the uh, forest conditions, it's based on uh, the drought, it's based on uh, what, uh, how the weather patterns are setting up uh, with Pacific Oscillation and ocean temperatures. So it, it gives us an indication of what's coming our way for the season and, and where it might hit and what that might cost. And right now it, it's predicting that we will fall short. Um, the question or the comment that Mayor Navarre talked about, which was a spruce bark beetle, at least in my state, but I know Colorado has issues, uh, the Northwest has issues. I mean, it's just a constant growing problem. Uh, for several years, I know in Alaska it was earmarked. We had earmarks that were able to do this. Uh, for some reason, some people in this body don't like earmarks. I do uh, because people are, I think, did not understand what it was. It wasn't adding to the budget. It was taking from the existing budget, and it gave some discretion of how to kind of attack these issues. Do you think we have enough resources to go after? And I use spruce bark beetle in my state, but I know they're different in other states of, uh, you know, basically beetle kill or uh, – forests that have dead kill in them. Is there, are we doing enough there, or do you think that's an area that may be, we better be watching carefully here, because that could be growing because of these drier temperatures and droughts that we're facing? Does that, does that question make sense? Yes, it does. The, okay. the drier temperatures, the drought, uh, uh, the condition of the forest, uh, the, the age of the forest, in the West, it's largely a disturbance forest, and it was created by disturbance, and it's being uh, regenerated by disturbance, mm -hmm. fire, insect, and disease. That's going to continue on a large scale, and uh, there are things we can do to mitigate that. We can't stop it, but uh, uh, yes, there's more that can be done to uh, help uh, the, with the impacts of it. Let me, if I can, to Mayor Navarre, and then I'm going to go to you two in just a second here. Mayor Navarre, you, at this point, you don't have any more federal resources for that type of activity in a spruce bark beetle uh, cleanup or management at this point, or do you still have federal resources you're still tapping into, or is that pretty much gone, and what are you doing now to kind of combat that issue? What did we do? In other words... Uh the grant money you used to get, do you still have any of that remaining that you can still use to do some of that spruce bark beetle management, or what are you doing now that those resources are pretty limited to manage that dead well, kill? Well, it actually happened uh, uh, last time I was mayor from 96 to 99 where we identified the problem, and before that, Mayor Gilman had, had come to the Alaska legislature for some funding in order to do some, some fire breaks in a Cooper Landing area. Uh, when I uh, succeeded Mayor Gilman in 96 uh, and flew over the entire Kenai Peninsula, uh, uh, I was actually shocked at the level of, of infestation and the potential for uh, a, a huge fire. And, and really, because of the dis different land ownerships and agency oversight and things like that, what we did initially was put a task force together that worked very well uh, reaching common ground on, on things that everybody could agree on. Natural fire breaks and enhancing them, whether they're power lines where you have a, a hundred foot right away and uh, trees on each side that are 200 feet tall. Trying to uh, uh, broaden those a little bit. Uh, making sure that you clear uh, uh, rights of ways for roads a little bit further. And then perhaps as importantly is, is uh, the uh, FireWise program, defensible space, uh, things like that, because the, the people want to stay in their homes and protect their homes. It's their largest investment, uh, oftentimes in their entire life, and so uh, and, and so making uh, plans ahead of time that put resources into uh, those types of, of necessary 
areas so that when you have an event like this, um, you have the ability to uh, actually combat it on a, a, a reasonable basis and at the same time uh, uh, putting adequate resources to it and protecting the folks who are actually out there fighting it as well as the, the urban areas. So um, it, we still have uh, areas that, that we could uh, use additional funding for, but you know we're going to go forward with that in any event. The the uh, educational process for homeowners, um, you know where they can where they can build the uh, protections as best they can, and then uh, uh, making sure that uh, our emergency operations plans are in place. You know the the uh, reverse 911 system in this case worked exceptionally well for pre-notifying folks, and then when there was an evacuation in two areas, uh, we could get them out in an orderly manner. Um, again, it, it, th those are things that are critically important in the interim between what, as I said, we know are going to be growing, uh, uh, growing numbers of fires. Thank you very much. Let me, Jim, I said I have no more questions, but I, I have one more. And I just, just remembered when Senator Mayor, uh, Mayor, Navarre, Mayor Navarre was talking to me, and that was down in, I saw this map, and it's a utility company. I think it might be Homer Electric, but I'm not, I just want to say the, a utility company that had a power line going through two federal properties, one a, a reserve and one not, uh, and yet they were able to clear, you know, their power line area, so they had a clear area, all the way, and then this new designation of federal land goes after that, and they can't clear. Yet it's, I mean, if to, to anyone else, you wouldn't know the difference between the land, except you suddenly see there's no clearing going on. And their point was, part of their job, because they have to access those utility lines, is to have that area cleared, but also from a fire protection area, it's a fantastic, uh, you know, opportunity there. Um, do you work, uh, have you run in this problem elsewhere where you might have a, a different designation by a federal agency of one land and then another designation side by side, and maybe it's only a west area, you know, the, the west has this problem. And yet, I mean, I, I couldn't believe the map. I mean, it's just clearly, they show where they've clear cut, you know, this strip for the power line, great, fire break, everything, utility corridor, then it just stops. But the utility corridor still keeps going with the utility line, and they're not allowed to clear this other area, but yet the fire could occur anywhere. Do you run in this, and is there something, not to get you in trouble with any other agency, but is there something we could do here legislatively to help this problem? Uh, yes, we run into the problem, and it's not just uh, differences of federal ownership, it's uh, differences with state and private ownership. So when we get into this, uh, it really takes everybody coming together, and, and different agencies have different mandates and different environmental clearance processes that they have to go through. But when you have a common problem such as this, and you have values at risk that need to be protected, then you need to find a way of working it out together. Well, I may bring you an issue then, because I just think, because in some of these states that have this huge swath of jurisdictional issues, especially federal land, it seems like we should figure out this, because the common, I mean, on one hand, we're watching one area burn up, the other hand, we're controlling it on another land because we did this right way. Another hand, just the other side just burning up because we didn't do the right control. So we, we'll, we'll follow up. Let me, if I can, to uh, William and Kevin, thank you very much for being here. And there was a, uh, a recently released national wildfire strategy. Are you either one of you familiar with that? William, you want to go first? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I assume, and, and if I'm wrong, it is correct me, can I assume that you were engaged, your, your organization or members of your organization might have been involved in that strategy or at least responded to the strategy? Can I? We were, uh, our organization was not directly engaged in that. Um, okay. We certainly have had input, you know, um, over the years um, talking about, uh, about fire management issues and about, you know, kind of the, the more strategic picture with, uh, you know, how we manage our landscapes across, uh, across the country. Do you think, and why I bring this up is Kevin had a comment about a Blue Ribbon Committee, and it seemed, and I, you know, one thing I'm always nervous about, to be frank with you, is another committee around this place. Uh, because we'll, we'll committee stuff to death. You had mentioned, matter of fact, the IG report, which is a question I'm going to ask my staff to say, okay, that IG report came out. What have we done? What have we not done? Because as we found with the VA, when you have IG reports, you actually should respond to them, um, and this might be the same thing. But do you think this strategy 
could morph into where we engage stakeholders, and this again for both of you, um, to engage stakeholders to say, look, we got this strategy. Is it the right strategy? What do we need to do? What's the action plan that goes with the strategy to move us forward in a preventive way as well as a response in a sense? Can, can you respond to that? And I'm sure, you know. Um, I, I think the national strategy has, has great utility in terms of being a, a very strategic sort of broad-based document to get us to thinking about, about how we engage um, how we engage each other um, across jurisdictional boundaries, across geopolitical boundaries, uh, across other regional boundaries, because that's part of the problem that we have in this country where some of those land issues that we, they're jurisdictional. Yeah, ab absolutely they are. And, and it becomes very difficult and, and, and challenging um, to, um, to try to deal with fire across those boundaries because you, because you have to understand, uh, fire doesn't respect geopolitical boundaries or, or other jurisdictional boundaries. We, we saw that in Kenai. They they really and, don't. <laughs> and so so the challenge for us as, as as a country is to figure out how can we engage the stakeholders and get people to understand that this is not just a federal issue, this is not just a state issue, this is not just a local issue. This is a national issue that that everybody you know, has skin in the game on. And well, well, good example of that, I think, three billion plus taxpayer money. Absolutely. Uh, and I think the data point that, uh, Jim, you gave, which I thought was interesting, 98% of those, you know, you get right at them, but it's that 2% that then add to 30% of the costs. And it's, it's kind of, and, and those are ones where we may not be as aggressive as we maybe could be. And so I thought that was an interesting Interesting quote. Let me, can, can I ask, I'm going to jump back and forth a little bit, but you, you heard the comment, commentary here. Because I, like I, I like the idea that we kind of attack this issue in the sense of what do we need to do? Because there are clearly changes in the environment. For Alaska to have a fire of that magnitude in May is unheard of. And we were very, very fortunate where it was uh, and how quickly they could control it on the back end, because it could have got to a whole bunch of businesses, homes, property, lives. And it seems like these little things of prevention could actually, in, in some cases, you know, we, we lucked out on one. It jumped over a river, but then uh, it hit a swamp. You know, thank God the swamp was there, because then it kind of moved a little different direction, and the winds helped us. But then those winds were moving left and right, literally, in a 24-hour cycle, aggressively moving that fire. Can, give me a thought on this strategy, and can it be morphed into this idea you have that getting these stakeholders in, just going after this? Well, let me first say, as an old firefighter, I'm not much on commissions or meetings either. <laughs> so, but I know a lot of firefighters, and you fit that mold, I can I, tell you right now. With, but you know, with that respect voice. to this issue first, I, I do want to laud what the National Action Plan has done. I do. I agree with Bill. I think it has an awful lot of utility. And the Wildland Fire Leadership Council, I think, is doing a very good job. The International Association is not part of that, but this is not a parochial issue for us. This is such a complicated issue. You can get firefighters in a room and you can come to consensus. On the ground, the coordination between federal, state, and local assets is tremendous. But it's more than just a fire problem. And in my oral testimony, I use the term holistic. And by that, I mean if you actually read the action plan, which I have in my hand and I think is a great document, all it talks about throughout the document is bringing people outside the fire, fire service, other stakeholders to the table. And quite frankly, efforts were undertaken several years ago by the Congressional Fire Service Institute, the International Codes Council, on trying to bring people together, and they weren't successful. Why? Because frankly, nobody had the hammer to get all the stakeholders sitting at the table. The home builders, the code enforcement folks, all of these people who weren't part of this effort but frankly, who need to be involved in a larger dialogue as it relates to this problem. Because as everyone testified, it is going to be a problem for many, many years. And my analogy to America burning was simply made to draw that point. Gotcha. I mean, if you look at the history there, and it worked very effectively. I mean, I, basically, if I can interrupt for a second, basically what, what happened there was Congress got involved and said, look, that's right. we see this as a national issue. We're not interested in the, you know, one group taking the lead or another group. We just want to have a strategy that has an action plan that we can look at and determine if we can fund it, help it, make it happen from the state, local, private, 
federal levels. That that's, that's kind of what happened there. Is that that's absolutely correct? And even though I do have an aversion to those type of commissions, <laughs> I just I really don't see any other entity aside from the federal government that can really force people to the table to have that conversation. W wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think the convener has to be the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think we need to be sort of start thinking outside the box of of how, uh, you know what do we need to do what what are the interests that we need to um, satisfy to get these people to the table um, for for some it may be uh, uh, we might need to consider um, some sort of incentive incentive program um, such as uh, you know if you participate in this program and and do certain uh, uh, pre treatments to your land uh, you could get a tax break for example. Gotcha. Um, so well, that's an interesting idea. So, um, mm -hmm. because again, um, it, it, as you described on the Kenai with the uh, with the utility corridor, if if we have people that are that are participating or landowners that are participating and other landowners that are not, um, that's really not going to solve the, the, the right. big problem. Um, what was more amazing about that? There were two federal agencies, one wanting to, one not. Uh, I mean, that is something we definitely have control over in this body. Let me ask you, you had said something that I thought also two things. One in your, I think your written testimony says, we are still doing business the old way and it's not working. And then you also talked in your uh, oral presentation uh, about apprenticeship programs, which I'm always intrigued about apprenticeship programs. We used them quite a bit when I was mayor of Anchorage. Uh, and obviously as a senator, I use internship programs all the time. Uh, I was intrigued by that. Can you, when you say it's business kind of as usual, not changing much, can you give me kind of a sense of what are those innovations that we need to be doing, uh, which I do agree with you on the issue of the temporary. Uh, we had the same problem when I was mayor of Anchorage. We had great Parks and Rec people that came back every single summer, every single summer. They had probably 20 years doing it. But because of the way the system worked, the first, someone could come in that's been working for the city full time, first year employee, and walk in and have a better chance of getting that job than the temporary. We changed that because we thought that was not right. Because if you got 20 years working this seasonally, the odds are you're pretty good at it. Because we wouldn't hire you back seasonally for 20 years. So besides that, which I, you know, obviously I've introduced legislation to fix that, um, we think there are a lot of interesting ideas here. Tell me what you're thinking here when you say the old way. And maybe well, I'll turn to you too, Kevin. So. Yeah, I, I mean, another good example is the funding issue. How, how, do we pay, how do we pay for fire suppression? I mean, historically, uh, federal agencies have basically been given a budget of, you know, X, X million dollars um, for fire suppression. And when the money runs out... Um, we rob everywhere. Yeah, the agency is forced to look elsewhere in its budget to, uh, uh, to come up because, again, um, we can't, you know, fire is unique, uh, right. relatively speaking, uh, in terms of an agency's program. We can't just, when the money runs out, we can't just walk away and fold our tents up and leave. Is, is it, again, so you support the concept of the widen Crapo bill or Absolutely. what we're doing in the appropriations committee, which I feel very confident we're moving the right path here. Uh, when we get the interior budget bill, which will be, pro I'm hoping, uh, we're doing two bills a, a week now. We just did two more today. We'll do two more next week in the full committee. Uh, and that seems like, I mean, I, I'll be frank with you, I was somewhat shocked when I got here and found out we were funding at about a 20% level or so. And I'm like, well, we know the average. We know what's going to happen. We would hope not, right? Everyone hopes we don't spend anything in disaster firefighting, but that's not real but maybe this approach is a better, so that's a new approach that you think would be huge. Yeah, I think, I think that, that that's going to ensure that the agency has the funds um, in the programs that um, help it to accomplish its mission, whether those programs are, are uh, pre-treatment, um, instead of robbing money from, from pre-treating uh, forest fuels, uh, they'll have a full budget uh, in that area, and we can continue to do some of these projects to uh, uh, to mitigate, um, you know, uh, uh, future uh, fire occurrences and uh, and hopefully allow us to, to uh, catch these fires when they're small so before they escape and become these huge catastrophes. Thank you. Kevin? Well, I absolutely concur. I mean, we have to have a different mentality. Years ago, wildland fires were largely uh, contained in areas that were simply that. They were wildland. They were massive fires, but part of healthy forests is fires a natural phenomenon, and they burn. And some of the mentality was you allow it to burn. And I'm certainly not qualified from an environmental standpoint to comment on that. 
But from a firefighting standpoint, with the development of Wildland Urban Interface, we really have to change our view on how to do that. Now, when you talk to you know the folks in terms of, uh, of my membership, which is municipal, we don't represent the, the, the federal wildland folks, but almost all of our people west of the Mississippi are engaged in wildland firefighting. Right. The coordination on the ground is great. There are standard mutual, mutual aid agreements where it's automatic. If, for example, in California, we have a California Department of Forestry uh, station adjacent to federal lands, they immediately respond, and in many cases, are able to mitigate the event before federal resources are actually there. Conversely, the same thing happens uh, when there's a federal station near, near a state land or a privately held land. Uh, their radio systems are very compatible. There's a unified command structure, and it all works very well. However, what we are hearing from our folks is that there is an issue, and it gets back to money, on timely repayments for local assets when they're assisting the federal government. And this is something that, particularly in California, some municipalities and, and counties are actually skewing a little bit mutual aid agreements because they're concerned about the repayment. And it gets back to basically money. Uh, the same thing applies with training. I agree with Bill 100%. Training is vitally important. But when you have a municipal fire department that has to train its people on structural response, EMS, hazardous material, clearly there's only so much money in a pot. And one of the things that we want to ensure uh, you know, the red card, the qualified uh, certification versus a trained certification. We want to make sure that every one of our firefighters who's going to be exposed to a wildland fire is going to be number one, safe, and number two, effective on the fire line. And there's no substitute for training, and unfortunately, that costs money. Let me ask one last question, and again, I want to thank the whole panel here. This is helpful. I know in the Funny River Fire, I think, and Mayor Devar, correct me if I'm wrong, I may not get this right, or Jim, you might be able to know this. I think we had to uh, bring in uh, two Canadian um, water tankers, if I remember right, in addition to our crew, if I remember this right. And I, if, if, Am I right on that, Mayor Navarre? I think that's what happened down there. That, that is what happened. They brought in a couple of Black Hawk helicopters also, and they had uh, uh, planes that were uh, also deploying retardant uh, in areas that it, it would be effective on the particular fuel sources. Um, here's my general question then on that, and I think, um, Jim, you laid out a really good inventory, kind of our mutual agreements. I'm assuming that was one of them, our international agreement with Canada, especially Alaska, and probably the states that border um, from the lower 48. Do you, on the equipment that we have, that we operate, or that we have relationships with, uh, do, we, do we believe that we have good resources for their continued maintenance and upgrade, or is that an area that we have to really look at here uh, long term to make sure that we're not, because let's assume, for example, this season's a busy season again. It's the argument you might make for a guy doing aviation that the more hours you put on that plane, the more wear and tear it takes, and therefore the, the capacity for it to operate longer term diminishes. Do you see that as a uh, an issue that we need to really re-examine because these fires are more severe and happening on longer spreads of time, meaning their seasonal, season is longer, I should say. Is that, a, is that something we have to look at or is that something you are looking at or? Um, both. Uh, we are looking at it. Uh, we have made some strides. Uh, we have moved from a, a primary fleet of 1950 vintage aircraft that are getting tired to a next generation fleet, but we're just getting into that. So there's uh, there's a ways to go on making sure we've updated our aviation assets, especially the large air tanker portion of that. And uh, I'd say the progress is good, but we're not there. And we did something last year, if I remember this right, through the National uh, Defense Authorization Bill. I think we got 21, seven went in your direction, and 14 went to the Coast Guard, if I remember this correctly. That's correct. Of, uh, you know, I hate to use the word, but surplus planes from the military that we, you know, who knows what they were going to do with them. Uh, but they saw an opportunity, right? And we were able to mobilize them for Forest Service as well as for the U.S. Coast Guard. Is that? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that was a, a welcome uh, yeah. addition to the fleet, and uh, we don't have those yet, but we will, and we'll start uh, phasing them in next year. So that was uh, seven C-130Hs, and right. uh, we also got 15 Sherpa aircraft right. for our uh, smoke jumper platforms. Excellent. Well, I know we worked on that from our office with Senator McCain uh, because we thought this was a great win-win for not only for the Forest Service but the Coast Guard for 
uh, equipment that's desperately needed. So we were happy to do that. Let me end there. I think the record, the record will stay open for 14 days for other committee comments and or questions. Uh, I want to thank the full panel here, uh, especially Mayor Navarre, all the way from Alaska via, via uh, teleconference here or Skype or whatever we ended up here with, but you're here, which is good. Um, we appreciate that, uh, especially because you're dealing with a real live issue on the ground, and we thank the panel here. And thank you for your written testimony, because I know there's a lot of suggestions that some of you have placed in there that we'll absolutely examine. This committee that deals with emergency disaster first responders, uh, FEMA and others. Uh, this is an important issue, and I have a feeling, as you described very well, Mr. Hubbard, that the summer is just beginning, and we're already seeing a lot of issues. So thank you all very much. The meeting is adjourned, and the record will be open for 14 days.